Hello, I'm Greg Hall, CEO of Alligator Energy Limited. We're an Australian-listed uranium development company. We have an exciting in-situ recovery uranium project called the Samphire Uranium Project, which is at uh, the mid-development stage, starting to do fuel recovery test work into feasibility, into full approvals, uh, with an aim to get in production in 27 or so. In perfect timing for a long-term market which is advancing in uranium in a very, very strong manner. And we also have some broader exploration in the Arnhem Land region where the high-grade range of Jabaluka projects are, plus some very green fields exploration over a new basin structure called the Cooper Basin, which is very old for hydrocarbons but very young for uranium. So that's our company. Great. Good, good to see you. Um, Thank you, Matt. Raising money like comedy. It's all about timing, isn't it? Um, you seem to have quite a bit of cash last time we spoke in, in, in July and obviously topping up now um, to kind of to, you know deliver a kind of long long list of deliverables for you. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about the, the, the well, the, the, the quantum and the process and in what you intend to use the money for? Yeah, no, most certainly. So look, we it, it did surprise a few people that we uh, came out, but we with the cash we had in the middle of the year, we knew we had an increased ramp up of expenditure. So not only were we continuing drilling on the sam project, but we started fabrication of the pilot plant, ready for the fuel recovery trial. We have to run that fuel recovery trial, plus we're doing exploration. So so we knew we were going to ramp up our expenditures. The second key thing about it is a company like ours, which is intending in two years to be virtually ready for approval and financing, needs to have a certain level of cash in it. No longer can you be a $5 million, $7 million explorer. You've got to have a base level of cash that allows you to achieve what you need to achieve because in that development process time, you, you've got to get certain things done in a, in a time frame. So we raised uh, $25.5 million in a placement. We have a small share purchase plan out uh, listed out today for existing retail shareholders to also come in. The advantage of this with the expenditure we've got plus the projects we're going to be doing, by early 25, we're in the situation we'll have a successful fuel recovery trials with all the technical parameters, a full feasibility complete, probably the first two conditional offtake contracts in good supportive prices, uh, conditional upon approval of finance, and be basically they're working, already submitted our uh, minor lease approval documents and working with the government through the minor approval. So the, uh, it, this puts us in the position to be able to achieve all of that at Soundfire while growing the resource faster than we could have. And that's important because we, uh, we have a viable first project, but we know that if you're going to grow the resource, you set in your feasibility plans, not only for a first project, but also a duplication. So many things like that are possible now with the funding structure we have behind us. And that, that was the attraction of doing it. Okay, and, and we'll, come, we'll come to the asset or assets um, in, in a second. I just want to talk about the kind of the, the, kind of the corporate component and the, and the shareholder component. You attracted a lot of institutional shareholders in, in this recent raise. Um, you're, you know, and, and that's the want of genius to kind of move through the phases and be less less reliant on on the vagaries of, of, of re- retail sentiment. So. Can you give us a sense of where these institutional guys and gals came from? Are they mainly Australian or have they come from further afield? <laughs> They're mainly Australian, but a very good proportion of Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, and uh, right. at least three or four US. So we've always had a strong following in the US. Right. Well, it, 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 it's uranium. Um, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, they're looking for friends. Um, with, with that kind of new sort of uh, ramping up of the institutional um, uh, component of the, of the share register, are you going to be looking at things like rollbacks, especially with the kind of US component? They do tend to like, um, you know, h- higher higher price shares allows them as part of part of you know th- their their own remit to kind of invest into you. Aussies don't seem to mind you know billions of shares out, but is, is that something that you'd be looking to address at some point? Uh, not, not considering it now at all. And that's because, first of all, institutions do like to come into projects which look like they're going to be expanding and growing towards production, but they also like to see the liquidity so they can get out if they need to, for whatever reasons they might need to. So we have very good liquidity because of that. The second thing is the time you want to have a share price which is supportive of large licks of money coming in is going to be towards the end of a feasibility study or when you're uh, at the process of near approval. So um, it's more value to all our shareholders to have the liquidity present at the moment. 
So we, we're not looking at a consolidation anytime soon. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, and again, listen, the, 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 you raise quite a bit of money. And I, if, if you're a gold company, you'd be looking in rather jealously and going, well, how in the heck are they managing to do this? Uranium's going through a, a resurgence of the, of the last, you know, two, three weeks. Price, price is moving. It's a good indicator of sentiment. Uh, we've just come off the back of WNA. Um, and I think you were in Europe yourself at, at, a, at a conference. What are you hearing, feeling from utilities um, and indeed, you know, other, you know, uranium company, uranium wannabe producers, whether it be developers or, or former producers? Well, look, um, the, the World Weekly Fuel Market Conference I went to in June in Europe was, was very telling because um, you had uh, uranium producers, conversions and riches and utilities there all talking and you had uranium producers on the stage saying, look, when we get supportive long-term world price contracts that give us a return on their assets over a long enough duration to give us a good return for shareholders, then we'll produce more uranium. And you heard that from both major producers and junior producers or startup, uh, restart producers. You also heard utilities saying, we previously have purchased enriched uranium product in Europe, for example, off two suppliers. Now one of them's gone. We have to expand. We have to, for the first time in 20, 30 years, write some uranium contracts and conversion and enrichment. So You've got a changing dynamic where there was a, uh, a free amount of enriched product around the world, mainly Russian, but also other sources. And now people are having to go back to look at the components more. So that's driven the price, of course, enrichment, conversion, and uranium. We've also heard utilities talking and explaining about their cost base. So they are dealing in electricity markets. So they're talking about this is our fuel cost, this is our running cost, this is the regulated market we're in, this is the unregulated market. So therefore, we get different allowances for fuel cost in different markets. So the whole industry is investigating itself and explaining itself in that manner. The beauty of that is you're you're getting a willingness by utilities to consider higher prices to ensure they get security of supply over a long term. And you get suppliers who are willing to say, I'm happy to talk about a long term price provided we a long term contract, provided we can get a price of either the formula basis or we, we keep some upside as well as give you what you want at security. Um, and to that end, the recent buying in uh, the market, as, as most people will know, has been traders and, and investment funds buying. Um, there's been no utilities buying at 65 or 70 cents, or $70, sorry. But nonetheless, that does drive the impetus in the investment market and it drives the impetus in the, in the um, uh, ultimately in some long-term pricing because it will help set the definition. Suppliers want a market-related price while the price is moving. Utilities would love to get a fixed price. And so you end up quite often with a formula. But we took the opportunity to raise funds now when we had our share price had run hard. We raised funds at 10% roughly below our 10-day volume weighted average. We thought it's a fair price for where we're sitting in the market, uh, but it attracted the right sort of institutional money in. And to make it fair, we also are offering an SPP to our retail shareholders. And and this just gives us the runway we need over the next two years to get where we want to go, which will basically be almost pre to pre production stage. So um, that's the main aim. It, it, it all we was planning this marketing from July onwards, but the run up in price always makes you decide do we go now, do we wait? So someone I hear I hear this constantly in hindsight said well, why'd you go now? Why didn't you wait till the end of October? And I said, can you guarantee to me where our share price will be at the end of October? Because I know where it is now. Okay, so it's a, it's always that's always the judgment you make as a board, and we do this as a board, and uh, we, we make the judgment that this was the right way to get the funds into the company to go to this area, uh, to this uh, uh, main game that we're trying to get to in 2025. Yeah, I don't, again, constant debate on this platform as well. You know, and I think most people end up, you know, take it when it's there. Certainly in these markets, but look, that, that's all kind of your um, your own risk risk assessment and the challenge, yeah. challenges ahead. I mean, what what do you now with this money in and obviously a, a plan ahead of you, you know, through through feasibility study. What do you see as the main cha- main challenges? What what are the main risks that you um, are trying to manage with regard? So it's just very focusing, just focusing on alligator rivers um, for, for for now, or sorry, sorry, Samphire for now. So rather. Samphire, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Samphire, we've got the full field recovery trial, so the pilot field trial. So 
you can do all sorts of bench scale testing. You can use uh, full cores out of the ground. You use the, the saline groundwater we have. We do all of that with the genuine bench testing, which companies have done for years. But the real proof in the pudding is getting in the ground with some trial rings, bring the solution out, extracting it, and putting it into a clean uranium solution, which can be packaged and, and shipped. So that's the trial we're doing in early 2024. Uh, we're, we're geared up for that. The pilot plant's under construction, the two containerized pilot, pilot plant, and uh, and we're already drilling the monitoring rings ready for that. So that's going to give us the tech, final technical economic parameters for a feasibility. But before we jumped into this, we put out, based on the, uh, the bench scale work, a scoping study in March this year. That scoping study said at a million pound a year, which was a, a very base level project, 130 million Australian capex, a 30 US dollar per pound all in sustaining cost. This project, even of that size, made money. Uh, with the good return. And we were conservative. We put in a 30 to 40 percent uh, escalation and contingency factor. Uh, so before we decided to go to this field trial, we did that scoping study. Now, two things. We're updating a resource through October with the drilling we've done this year to lift the resource to target lifting the production rate in the a scoping study, and we're going to do an updated scoping study at the same time. So that will lift the economics in the project. But the real, um, almost like the final risk hurdle we've got is that um, uh, pilot field recovery trial. But you don't enter that lightly. You enter it with an excellent knowledge of what you believe is going to occur and the ability to trial different levers during that trial to get the best optimal outcome for the feasibility study. So that's a key one for us coming up. Okay, and um, obviously with I- ISR, we're talking, you know, we're, we're potentially to people talking, thinking water tables. You know, water is very important. We talked last time out around this kind of so- social license, um, as and and we're seeing this again all around the world, where social people companies are forgetting to manage that kind of social license component, and sometimes it's sneaking up and hitting them in the back of the head. Um, how are things on the ground? locally well we started this work even while we we're acquiring the project and dealing with the, lo- the parcelist we have a full um, land access agreement with the main parcelist who uh, with the black bush properties on where the planned um, pilot plant is to operate and where the planned future production plant will operate so that's in place we're now engaged with the southern parcelist for a border exploration program but but they they want to learn about our business they want to learn about radiation they want to learn about groundwater they want to learn about it. so so we're talking with them, and and uh, we've all already offered to develop a land access agreement. The Indigenous people, while native title is extinguished, we do have with the Bungalow a native title agreement, and they've been out and done their third survey work with us and given us a broader clearance for more drilling regionally, as well as the, the field trot. But especially, you know, though, as well as that, we're 20 kilometres from the town of Wyala, which is an iron ore mining steelmaking town as well. But we've had massive engagement in the town, open sessions, presentation sessions. We've just taken uh, four weeks ago the Wyala Council, the full mayor, the mayor and the, the elected members out, and, and we've just gone through a four-week open period for our approval for the film trial and uh, are about to get the feedback from that. But the good thing is, and, and the, the visibility of how you think you're going there is, uh, on certain websites in Wyala, around Wyala, we see people asking questions, how come they've never engaged? And then you see people from within Wyala saying, of course they have. I went to their session in December. I went to this. You have a councillor coming on saying, we went out to the site and we saw this. So in other words, when you get peer-on-peer discussion around your project where people are correcting others who've got misconceptions, then you know you've been doing a lot of groundwork. And we're, and we're getting that. The government in South Australia is is supportive of uranium mining, but they don't give their approvals lightly. They are experienced enough. They've given approval for five uranium mines, or ISR, all of which are run, and they know how to regulate them. So we're working through that process also with them. Okay, and and, and, and just coming, and, and I appreciate that. Um, and just talking about how you build a company, how you build a company which will actually produce pounds, and you know. Timing we talked about earlier in this conversation is old model pounds on the ground. That's what drives value. New model we're desperate for this stuff. We're desperate for you know everyone to be successful because we need all the pounds we can get. How are you as a board deciding and defining you know resource size or, or, or cut off for that resource size for feasibility? It, 
because he, he said, getting, you got to get this balance between proving you can actually produce pounds in, in a can and building up something which is obviously, you know, significantly bigger and maybe comparable to some of the other developers that are out there at the moment. You've got, you got to weigh that up. So how are you coming at that? Well, there's two things. In, in, in situ uranium recovery process, the advantage of this is it's a much less, in, less invasive but also a much cheaper method of startup and operation. So the Beverly uranium one, which started in 1998, started with a resource of 25 million pounds, got running at 1.2 million pounds a year, then expanded up to three as they grew the resource. Now they're a four and a half million pound a year after discovering four more. And the same sort of things happen in multiple places in Wyoming. You start up with a small project and you expand. You make sure you've got enough room around the plant to add module, to add this, to add this. So you're not crushing, grinding rock. You're not lining an open pit. You're not uh, putting capital development in, in advance into an underground mine two years in advance before you get any more out, those sort of things. So it's a vastly different lining method, and it's very amenable to that initial startup, increase by 50%, double the project, increase again. So um, we, we've determined that even at 20 million pound, roughly our resource, and we're going to increase it, at 20, 25 million pounds, very much an amenable startup. It gives you 1.2 million power per year production rate for anywhere from 10 to 12 years, probably more. Um, and then, while you're doing that, you're doing more regional. Now, because we haven't had a chance to do the regional exploration yet, and there's a simple reason for that. One, we couldn't get enough drill rigs last year. We got four months of drilling last year. We had a full 10 months or so this year. We also didn't have the team last year. We've recruited the team over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, now we can expand that, but we're going to put an exploration target range out because we've got a known deposit called Plant Bush, five kilometres south. We've got high grade intersections to to the east of our main Black Bush deposit. We haven't had time to follow up and track down the roll fronts and follow them through the channels. So we know what we have to do to expand that resource. We just haven't had the time to do it. So um, most people will remember we raised good funds in 2021. Then we recruited the team. We recruited uh, Dr. Andrea Marshall smith who's one of the most senior managers at Heathgate running the Beverly Four Mile Project. She came on board. She's now recruited all those key roles in ISR production because the other aspect about producing is not just resource, it's people. So your your viewers would know my background is managing open pit and underground mining operations. Andrea's background is managing the ISR operations. So we now have a principal geologist experience in ISR hydrogeologist experience in ISR, a senior process chemist experience in ISR, an environmental manager who knows the area where we are. He grew up in the area where we are. So until you get that team and the, and the, and the other professionals around them that know how to run a future operation, they've done well field design. They know how much it costs to drill a well field. They know the startup issues you're going to have with the process plant. Uh, and, they, and they know the chemistry, the complexity of the chemistry that's going to occur in that process plant. So... We have the team now that's going to work with the money going forward. So I think two things. We will be expanding the resource, but it's not like you have to grow it before you start a project. You have to show you've got future growth to help attract the funds, and that's important. Uh, but the most important to me is the culture and the team that we're putting in place. Right, okay. And just sticking with, because I want to kind of... Um... I want to kind of get a sense of what I'm investing into. It's not just, say, hey, it's another uranium junior. I love uranium. I'm, I'm investing. It's like it, it is small but perfectly formed. But if I remember back to the kind of um, the project scoping numbers, there was like circa what, 130 million uh, Aussie capex and 29, 30% IRR. So it's, it's good, good, you know, de- decent margins, but it, 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 it was small. So what we're saying is we are confident that we can improve on those numbers in terms of scaling it we i think you did that at 65 bucks uranium yeah. obviously we're over that now that's Ooh, right hey sure yay yeah. so, take a moment for that yeah. <laughs> so, you know i think the ask is 71 you know so you're over that so even at those old, older numbers um you're making money good news um but are you confident the market understands the fact that you have the ability to scale this to replicate this and you now as you say very importantly got the team with the ISR experience to help you deliver that. So do you, are you aiming for a specific set of numbers in, in, with the feasibility? Yeah. Um, yeah. In, 
do you have a sense of that, or is it a case of you know they just need to be slightly better and slightly more? No, it'll be um, twofold. It'll be twofold numbers. Right. The first will be uh, uh, the, the the firm resource that you're going to put in your production schedule for a feasibility study, which which uh, I, I think will be in the order of about twenty five million pound. And and out of that, if you do a good twelve to fourteen years at one point two million pound, you've got uh, a good project. But the exploration target round, which we'll be announcing later this year, we can then physically show on the ground. Here's our range of what we think is in this area based on the drilling, which is not good enough for resource category yet, but based on what we know or what we found where we've expanded the same sort of figures out elsewhere, we think we're going to have about this. We think we're going to have about this. So we'll have spread down our lease, a main lease area over five kilometres or more. We'll have these areas say, this is what we can have as a range here, this is what we have as a range here, this one. So in other words, we'll show where the growth occurs because we know it from existing good grade uranium pots. So that first first uh, feasibility uh, resource of say let's say twenty five million pound or whatever the target is going to be, we're announcing in November what that'll be. By the way, uh, I think that'll give us a good feasible project. But part of the feasibility is you can do an expansion option as well, and we're going to do that as well because you want to make sure you've got a modular construction on the part that you can just duplicate it on the area you've got. So we'll, we'll do both. But uh, look, to give you some flavour, while Beverly started at £25 million, pound, it probably ended up at twenty five thirty. dollars um, Four Mile was about £40 million pound and it's still running. So, um, you know, you really want to build up that good target towards a £40-plus million pound project, which is going to run 20 years. That's what I would envisage we could do over the coming four to five years. Okay, okay, okay. Well, look, um, I guess we'll hear more about you know how, how the uh, test uh, goes and um, and the numbers in November. Not not too far away, um, for, for sure. C- can we like, maybe worth just talking about the, the rest of the portfolio, if, if, even if it's just to kind of very quickly sort of package it. Once like we talked last time out, obviously about Piedmont Italy and and maybe trying to find find someone for that. Um, how's that going? Uh, look, it's slow. It's um, we while we've got initial targets we could drill, we're reluctant to do that and spend the funds. Uh, we don't think it's going to be a value. We've done some uh, EM survey, which has shown well. Yes, you might have some targets, but you also got graphite in the ground. We also know that there's a broad package over thirty kilometres that you actually need to do some greenfields initial evaluation. But do you really want to do that as an Australian uranium come in as your was company based out of Australia? Not likely. So therefore, we are. We said that in our recent projects update. We're, we're re- reigniting the search for, for looking for a, a, someone to come into that project. So that's definitely what we're doing. In terms of alligator rivers, um, good. We uh, Nublek North project, which has not been explored by anyone for since the eighties. We're now on there getting the geology sorted out and lots of rab drilling. We've done some IP surveys and, and DM. Now we're about to do uh, potentially our first deeper RC into our initial targets. And we said that in our projects announcement that we were planning to do that. Um, but the aim of this was developing these 20 or so key target areas that will do RC drilling, deeper RC drilling on next year, mainly. It's about a three-year, two and a half, three-year program to get the geology sorted out underneath the underlying regolith, the, the weather zones, and find out what's there. Now, the good thing is our neighbours to the south, DevEx, have had good intersections on the U40 prospect, which borders us. Uh, we're going to be trialling some work there, and um, and we'll see what else comes out. But it's look, even our, our company has found some great all-grade intersections in different projects up around Arnhem Land there, but we just haven't thought anything be, together beyond about £7 million. Um, all you know is that if you jag one the size of Ranger, that's a game changer, right? So um, that's, that's what we're doing, and we, we've got good... Relationships and we're doing good work on the ground. Um, and big, big Lake? And Big Lake. Well, the other one we're excited about is Big Lake. So the Cooper Basin, I've explained before to, to your listeners that, that the Cooper Basin is a hydrocarbon basin, had oil and gas production for 70 or 80 years. Uh, with sediments overlying that basin, only uh, let's say 200, 300 kilometres north of Four Mile, are the same sediments as Four Mile, Honeymoon, Bosses Project, and Beverly. So those sediments, the NAMBA and the air formation, just haven't been explored for uranium. Now, we've had a sedimentary basin geologist for a year doing getting all the available public seismic data, and now we've targeted where we want to be. We've finished a, an indigenous agreement with the main group there. They're coming on to the ground to do our first full clearance a little bit later than we wished, but this year, such that we can drill early next year. So that's a test not only for whether there are uranium traps, 
But if we find uranium traps, the potential are there's more of them. So it's a test for a new field, potentially. So that's exciting, but it's Greenfield's exploration. Greenfield's exploration is always high risk. It, it, it is. And I guess f- focus on the prize that people are valuing at the moment, because that, that's, that's hard. People are struggling to get things valued properly at the moment, which, uh, which is obviously Sam Farr. Um, Willie Craig, I appreciate the update, and really it was just a kind of dial in to sort of see, you know, you know how you can allocate that capital. And uh, as explained, there is a plan, and there's also a bit of news coming out pre-Christmas. So, um, stay in touch. Let us know how you get on with those things. And uh, uh, as always, uh, congratulations. Thank you very much, Matt. That was great to talk to you.